Well, good evening. Uh, I must say this is a, a larger group of people than I was expecting. I was uh, not sure when, when uh, uh, Daniel and Philip asked me to talk if, uh, if it maybe just would be a handful of people we'd sit on in a circle around some chairs and sort of uh, spin some ideas and chew the fat and so on. But um, so I'm pleased that you're here and uh, and and this that post right there is really distracting. Is there, am, am I missing people behind the post? Um, it's okay. Well, think about where we are right now. And I don't mean here in the state, in this, in this in this room, but a week ago right now. Most of us were watching the TV and thinking, oh, isn't this just great political theater? It's been such a Oh, such an arduous, arduous, what, year and a half or two years or whatever. But, but a week ago, well, there was this kind of seismic shift. Uh, and, and one of the, the uh, just from an observer, if you just, just purely uh, for the sake of sort of political theater, it was delicious to see the experts squirm. Wasn't it that the, the people, if you, if you follow real clear, clear politics, for instance, Nate Silver was given Hillary Clinton 85% betting odds. If someone took those odds, they made a lot of money. And, uh, and so there was a whole uh, narrative going on that was indicating one outcome, and then something very different happened. And I think part of uh, what we need to do is try to figure out why and, uh, to, and I want to, to, to try to, to, to do this in a way that would uh, try to situate this Donald Trump thing uh, in a historical context and then also a theoretical context. And just to start with, I want to ask this question or just make this observation. Think of how many, first of all, people were surprised. Some were shocked, others, some were delighted. And some were just dismayed. You see the look of utter confusion on the faces of some people. And, and, and first, let's just talk about the dismay. I mean, on one hand, it's understandable. I think Donald Trump said plenty of things that were worthy of dismay, um, that, that were uh, offensive. Um, but Think about the, uh, the st I just, it was, as I was driving home tonight, heard that there was traffic problems in downtown DC because of protesters. So they're actually rioting in the streets over this election. And I suppose on one hand we could say, well that just indicates the health of our democracy because people really care. Um, on the other, rioting on the streets. Um, people, uh, not my president, and some much more vile kinds of responses, um, along with the, the, the kind of rioting, we have despondency. And I want to suggest, in part, that this represents, not, not completely, but in part, this represents a re-paganization of politics, this kind of response that we see. And here's what I mean. <clears throat> People without deep religious convictions or without, as we could say in another sense, a, a profound sense of eternity tend to make politics ultimate, tend to make politics, expand politics in a way that, that, that it is it's their, their, their entire framework for their self-understanding and their understanding of their world and society is tied up in the political structure. It's all that there is. It becomes ultimate. Even many religious people today, people that claim to be religious, are little more than what Christian Smith calls moralistic, therapeutic deists, which in practical terms means functional atheists. But as we know, Augustine, um, transformed politics in his day with his monumental work, City of God. In the classical world, as you'll recall, uh, politics and religion often bled into each other, and it was sometimes difficult to, to recognize any kind of division between the two. 
politics was of ultimate concern. You'll recall Plato imagined a perfect society ruled by a philosopher king, and if we could just get those things right, everything would be fine. Happiness would ensue. Peace and order would be the result. Aristotle, obsessed with identifying the best kind of constitution, because if we can get that right, everything will fall into place. Politics in the classical world, then, is of a kind of ultimate concern. And one of the reasons is, is because a conception of eternity wasn't present. But what Christianity does is changes this. And, our, and Augustine articulates this so well. Christianity, as Augustine showed, uh, showed us that, that politics is not ultimate that for the Christian, our citizenship is elsewhere. And therefore, the state is of, always of concern, but never of ultimate concern. That is, uh, that politics, in a way, is defanged by Augustine. Not that it's made unimportant, but it's made secondary. And for that reason, Augustinian Christians can absorb political defeats. Yeah, it's, it maybe goes against you one time, it'll go the other way, but these are not ultimate concern. Christians know how to live in the face of success politically or defeat, knowing that neither is permanent, and that the justice that perhaps one regime can accomplish is a tenuous justice that can easily slip away, and that we live on the edge on a knife edge between justice and calamity, and that's the human condition, which is to say humans or Christians understand the tenuous nature of political justice and political regimes, which, uh, which is to say uh, that I think, at least in part, this recent election has been so traumatic for some people is that they have placed their faith in politics rather than recognizing eternity as the proper locus and object of our concern, too many people today have placed their faith in a particular political party, a political, political person, and a political program. They have come to place their faith in a nebulous and abstract notion called progress. How often have you heard recently, in recent years, that if you are of a particular political persuasion, you are on the right side of history? What a comforting place to be. But think of how disorienting this is to see this election, this outcome of this election. It appears that the right side of history suffered a, a setback. That there, there, are, there are a lot of people in the United States who, don't, who haven't gotten the message, who don't understand the right side of history, who seem to be actually marching in a direction contrary to history. Now, of course, this notion of a right side of history indicates and is, is predicated on a, an understanding that history has a direction, and it's knowable, and it's by those who use it, rooted in a kind of political program characterized by the infinite expansion of liberties or freedoms and the infinite expansion of notions of equality. Well, no wonder there's a kind of disequilibrium in the wake of this election. And it's, it's a, a kind of deeply disorienting for many. And it's not surprising that in that disorientation, there's a kind of uh, irrational striking out against those who would refuse to acknowledge the logic of history. This election brought to head something we've all been aware of and intuited for a while, and that is there's been a breakdown of consensus. A loss of any understanding of the common good a loss of a common moral vocabulary, a loss of any ability to articulate common ends. 
And with that, ironically, that is, with the loss of a coherent moral vocabulary, we've seen simultaneously an explosion of the language and claims of rights. Rights talk is everywhere. Rights talk unmoored and disconnected from any kind of metaphysical conception of the person such that rights are nothing more than claims of what I want. Rights and desires have become identical. And really the language of rights is just a moral disguise for my desire. In such a context, we have what the philosopher Alistair McIntyre called a moral theory that is merged. He calls it emotivism. Emotivism is a moral theory that reduces all notions of the good to what I desire. What I feel. If I feel something, it must be right. And if I feel it, you can't object to it because, well, you don't feel it. These are purely subjective moral claims that are not rationally adjudicable. It's crept into the language of, of popular culture. It's crept into the language that you students use. Think of how often when you're trying to frame an argument, you say, well, I feel this. It's the language of emotivism attempting to express an argument, but it's doing so not in the language of a classical classical rational conception of the human being, but one that's trafficking in a vocabulary rooted in an emotivist moral philosophy. In such a context, emotivism and emotion become the only means of public expression. And this is borne out politically in terms of the only kind of political expression that we have left and we can call that the politics of the protest. For protests aren't rooted in rational discussion, debate, or argumentation. Protests are rooted merely in emotivist responses to positions that we find egregious. It is simply a return to a battle of force or power whereby the group that can yell the loudest win, which is to say the death of politics. For politics in any classical or Christian conception is necessarily rooted in a kind of rational debate about the nature of the good. Well, what is the, the nature of this loss of consensus? I want to suggest a, a theoretical framework to understand this and then a practical context by which we can understand this. First, a theoretical. One might be tempted to conclude that this election indicates a victory of conservatism over liberalism. I don't think it's that simple. I think the terms liberal and conservative have been badly disfigured in recent years. After all, what does conservatism mean? What does it mean to be a conservative? Well, uh, I suppose someone who listens to Rush Limbaugh every day or watches Fox News uh, or um, you can imagine uh, 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 goes to Liberty University or um, maybe Christendom College and, uh, and, and uh, a person who, who has certain views that seem to be in line with what they talk about on Fox News. I suggest at minimum, in terms of the vernacular, a conservative, and I think there's reasons to debate the various meanings of this, of this definition, a conservative emphasizes free markets, strong defense, traditional values, and gives lip service to small government. Now, those four notions are really not necessarily coherent at all. They don't uh, necessarily depend on each other, and I would suggest they are a kind of stripped-down, um, popularized conception of what has come to be known as conservatism, but I'm not sure it's helpful at all in helping us understand the landscape. On the other hand, liberalism 
It's often characterized as pro-government, pro-welfare state, and progressive on, on values. Conservatives, in this sense, in this colloquial sense, rail against big government. Liberals rail against big business. Both, ironically, seem equally incapable of reducing the size of business or government. How have they been so ineffective? Or, vice versa, how have they been so effective? Because what we see recently is a kind of a kind of monstrous combination of the two, what has come out to be referred to in many circles as corporate capitalism, uh, whereby the, the bad aspects of both big gov government and big business have been combined, and neither side, that is mainstream conservatives or name, mainstream liberals, seem to be very concerned about what we have. But let's consider more carefully this history of liberalism. Liberalism finds its roots in certain visions of the social contract thought. Some of my students, we've been talking about this, uh, that begins with a particular conception of the human person rooted in a so-called state of nature. In the state of nature, human individuals are perfectly free and perfectly equal. All authority is necessarily rooted in consent. There are no obligations that are legitimate, that are not rooted in consent. And in this idea, therefore, we see an insistence that we become constantly and increasingly liberated from any constraint that's not chosen by an act of explicit will. In the 17th century, philosophers uh, Bacon, Descartes, and others sought a liberation from the authority of Aristotle and a liberation from the church. Social contract thinkers sought a, 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 a liberation from nature itself. The state of nature is something we must escape from into something that we build ourselves. In the 19th century, we see a concerted effort to become liberated from any tradition the past itself becomes anathema, and ultimately with Nietzsche we see an attempt to liberate ourselves from God himself. This liberation, an attempt toward an absolute liberation, has been programmatic, systematic, and sweeping. The ideal is, a perfect, is perfect freedom from all limits, a perfect equality, which means in the 18th century and 19th century, an elimination of any social hierarchy. But once those social hierarchies are removed, this urge towards equality continues so that we come even to question a hierarchy of goods. Good itself becomes flattened out in a kind of egalitarian impulse so that we are no longer able to speak in terms of good, better, and best, no longer able to speak in terms of that which is good for a human being, not just good for me in my emotivist moment of, of, of claiming desires, but good for human beings per se. Those have been sacrificed so that all we're left with is desire. All goods are seen as equal. All preferences seen as equal. Of course, absolute freedom and absolute equality are at the end of the day incompatible. One had to triumph. That is, if we, if we give people, if people have absolute freedom, there's going to be inequalities that will emerge. You can just think in terms of property ownership. Give everybody uh, a certain amount of property, the same amount of property, and then give them freedom through hard work, bad luck, exchanges, different preferences, inequalities of property ownership will emerge. So freedom leads to inequality. If we emphasize equality is our highest ideal, freedom will have to be put at a secondary position. And as I said, one of these two ideals ultimately had to triumph, and it was equality, even at the expense of freedom. You can see this today on college campuses. 
that were ostensibly dedicated to the idea of free exchange of ideas, whereby anyone who dissents from the reigning orthodoxy is shouted down and silenced. And what is the reigning orthodoxy? The equivalency of all desire. They will be, in Rousseau's chilling words, forced to be free, compelled to accede to the party line. Now, in America, this liberal strain developed in two different directions. So-called classical liberalism of the 19th century emphasized individual autonomy, freedom. Welfare state liberalism of the 19th century emphasized economic equality. However, it's important to see that both are rooted in a liberal conception of the human person. That is to say, the unbounded and ob unobligated uh, individual root, uh, rooted in a conception of the person whereby no obligation is legitimate unless it is rooted in consent. So in this context, what is conservatism? Well, Americans uh, have uh, tended to be liberals of one stripe or another. Most Americans are rooted in this social contract notion of the autonomous human being, free and equal, and only obligations are legitimate that are rooted in consent. We have, of course, differences within this liberal camp. We have liberal liberals and conservative liberals, but both traffic in the same, I would say, false conception of the human person. A different scheme is needed, one that will help us make sense of the current world. That's the, the theoretical aspect. Now let's turn, though, uh, to a moment to the practical aspect of this election. First, I think we need to understand the victory of Donald Trump in light of some larger trends. We have to understand what happened here last week in the context of the Brexit vote uh, last summer in England. All right. And we have to see it in light of the resurgent nationalisms that are emerging in Western Europe. These kinds of movements don't make a lot of sense in light of a kind of uh, traditional liberal conservative dichotomy. They, they, they don't seem to, to end, that, that, that uh, uh, dualism doesn't seem to answer the questions. Which is to say, uh, think about this. Open borders, for instance, that is just a, the, the breakdown of the nation state, the, the, uh, the, uh, the complete abolition of borders would seem to um, warm the heart of conservatives if conservatives emphasize economic freedom as their highest concern. It would seem to be reasonable. That doesn't just, that there's something doesn't work there, something doesn't match, something seems missing. And I would suggest what we have here is a struggle between two fundamentally comp incompatible visions of reality and rather than conservative liberal, because those words have become so loaded, especially conservative, so I would say ultimately uh, bereft of meaning because of how it's been abused. Say on the one hand, we have uh, what I would call liberal cosmopolitans. What are those? A liberal cosmopolitan can see uh, this, this kind of character rooted in a Kantian notion of cosmopolitanism moving into uh, folks like uh, um, uh, Jürgen Habermas and Martha Nussbaum and so on in the 20th century, advocate open borders, the denigration, denigration of tradition, that is local particular traditions have to be set aside. They're, they're secondary at best. They're skeptical about traditional religion. Think about uh, the, the accusation, traditional religions cause wars, violence, misery, and all the rest. Got to set that aside, make it purely privatized, purely a function of personal preference and not in the uh, public eye and the public sphere. Emphasizing the brotherhood of humanity and they emphasize individual rights. That's the kind of things that we can see, I think, on the side of liberal cosmopolitanism. On the other hand, on the other side, uh, we have a different group, and for lack of a better name, I'm going to refer to them as to the traditionalists, um, which is not a good term if you want a successful um, political party or political movement 
in the early 21st century America. If you want to die in terms of politics, call yourself a, a traditionalist. If you want to grow your church, don't call yourself a traditionalist. All right? Tradition has come to be seen as, as an ugly word, especially by those who fancy that they are on the right side of history. The right side of history is always what? It's on the other side of now. It's never looking back. All right? We always have to move forward. Think of the language that's used everywhere in our political environment. A traditionalist hold on to some notion of limits. And this is a crucial term. Some notion of limits rooted in something prior to individual choice. That we are born into obligations that we don't choose. To which we are obligated to submit if we are to do our duty and to behave as a proper human being. These limits can be understood in terms of a tradition that we inhabit, in terms of nature itself, and ultimately in terms of God. That we are creatures. One way to understand human beings in this traditionalist sense is that we are fundamentally limited creatures. We push up against limits, but one aspect of wisdom is acknowledging the limits under which we live and learning to live within those limits. That human flourishing is not constituted by an abrogation of limits so that we transcend anything that is human, but to live and to understand what it means to be human within the confines of a world that God has created, a world that is normatively structured. Such a person will cherish national borders, cultural distinctives, local autonomy, particular stories, songs, traditions that are particularized, that are rooted, that aren't universalizable because they, are, they, they, they defy the kind of elasticity necessary to universalize a notion. There will be an emphasis on duties and obligations over rights. And concrete manifestation of this, I would suggest, is this debate about, about borders that we see that, that came to be such a, an acute feature of the campaign this time around. There are those who want to talk about borders and the integrity of nations, the integrity of nation states, and this is a kind of push back, a kind of recoiling from an alternative vision of the human good that wants to abolish the nation state and seek to overcome politics, seek to eradicate politics with a promise that something post-political is possible, that we, can, that we can have a post-political existence where the vicissitudes and the potential disagreements and violence that we see in politics can be overcome and we can recognize this withering away of politics, if you will, and enjoy a peaceful and stable and happy world. Well, a post political future I don't think is in the cards nevertheless where does all this leave us where what are the options here which way can we go is, is, there, is there a direction that we can turn is there a, a likely avenue that will be followed will this trajectory trajectory that was was established and launched by Trump and the Brexit folks, is this going to continue or is there going to be a reaction in the opposite direction? I would suggest that there are four possibilities uh, that we can perhaps consider. There may be more. First, liberal cosmopolitanism comes roaring back. It hasn't gone away, mind you. The Electoral College is, well, assuming that they, there, there are no uh, uh, unfaithful electors, is that uh, December 19th is going to uh, uh, vote and Donald Trump will be president and hopefully the, uh, the uh, well, hopefully I, I, gave, I tipped my hand, the Brexit thing will go through and, uh, and, and the European Union will start to collapse. Um, 
I just moved away from a dispassioned um, theorist of ideas to go get them. Um, but I think there are plenty of reasons that to think that this liberal cosmopolitanism isn't going away. It is so deeply embedded, not just in political practice, but in our habits of mind, in what Tocqueville called our mores. We are deeply, all of us are deeply implicated in this project, whether we want to be or not. In a sense, it's, it's become the water we swim in. And so to resist that requires a kind of monumental effort of self-understanding and reflection and a constant attempt to resist a, a, a steady momentum in the direction of liberal cosmopolitanism. The liberal cosmopolitans tend to hold the uh, non-governmental reins of authority, think media, think entertainment industry, these things that are so crucial in forming the imaginations of a citizenry are in large part, not exclusively, we certainly, uh, not exclusively, but in large part under sway of this kind of liberal cosmopolitanism. That's one alternative. It's just a, it's a, this is a kind of hiccup on the, the road, the happy road, we could say in retrospect if we're a liberal cosmopolitan. This was just, a, this was just a, an unpleasant moment in, in, in the march of history toward this progress that was so inevitable that, that, uh, and, and that we will eventually realize uh, this, this world of post-national, post-political utopia. There's another direction things could go. And it's not necessarily uh, mutually exclusive with the first alternative. And that is a descent into a kind of new form of tribalism. The characteristics of this kind of violent nationalism. What we saw with Trump, what we saw with the Brexit is kind of populism, a, 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 a groundswell of populist dissent against what was perceived as an elite who were uh, uh, exercising power, not in the interest of the people, but in their own private interests. And this populist groundswell pushed back against that. But populism historically is always a kind of dangerous moment that can very easily bleed into a kind of nationalism, Xenophobia characterized by scapegoating of the other, which is to say immigrants. Uh, jingoism, a kind of militarized uh, nationalism that can go very bad in a lot of ways. I think this possibility is already starting to emerge in some European countries as a direct result of immigration policies that are unwise and dangerous. What do I mean by that? I don't think an anti-immigration stance is wise or plausible, but what has to be realized, if national borders are to be maintained, if there's going to be integrity of what it means to be a nation, immigration must always be accompanied by a significant degree of assimilation. And if you have immigration without assimilation, what you're going to have is a kind of a continuing expansion toward a pluralism that ultimately defies the logic of the nation state, undermines the credibility of political power, and will prove itself to, to, be, to be fractious in many ways. But assimilation takes time. A nation can only absorb a certain percentage, a certain number of immigrants at a time. It's a process that's uh, increasingly difficult as 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 the cultures are further removed from each other. Simple example would be, it would be easier for, for a Spaniard to be assimilated into France than, than a Syrian. Right? There's, just, there's just a more cultural similarity between, even though there's difference. But here's the kicker. Assimilation, if it's to, if it's to happen, requires a deep faith. I don't necessarily mean a religious faith, but it's a faith that one's traditions and ways of life are good and therefore are worth holding up as a requirement for citizenship. You have to believe in 
in your country, in, in the traditions and institutions that constitute your a particular country. And if you don't, if you have lost that conviction, the urge, the, the impetus to, to encourage assimilation is going to wane. Today, I would suggest that the West is facing a crisis of faith. That is a faith in its own traditions and institutions. And this makes healthy assimilation increasingly difficult. The result is a kind of uh, expansive pluralism that is not conducive to stable and healthy political entities. And that kind of pluralism can result in a serious backlash, an instinctive and visceral us versus them, whereby the other, that is the outsider, is seen as the necessary scapegoat for the ills of an increasingly fragmenting society. That's the second option. The third option, and maybe some of you will like this or be drawn to it, and this is what I call a tempered liberalism. And I would suggest this is the, the wager that the American founders uh, were betting on. This was the position, even though it wasn't articulated in exactly the same way. They wanted to speak in terms of freedom, but they also didn't hesitate to speak in terms of limits. But here's the problem. Liberalism, in whatever guise, a conservative liber liberalism or a liberal liberalism, tends to devour all competitors. It's a caustic acid. It destroys everything that is not liberal. But then, here's the problem. It ends up undermining itself. It eats everything. It's like, it's like having uh, some special super-duper acid that, that will eat up the container you hold it in. Put it in, and then it goes, and then on the floor. Oh, no, the floor. There's the basement. All right, there's where do you stop this kind of caustic energy? This is liberalism. And the real question is, how do you contain liberalism? Which is, as I said before, characterized by this expansive demand for increasing freedom, a denigration of limits. Everything has to be abolished except my desire. The result, and something we see now, is what we could call illiberal liberalism. Think of what's going on in college campuses. Disagree, and what? You're shut down. This is in the name of freedom. Freedom is being sacrificed. How then can we contain liberalism? How can liberalism be tempered? Well, those of you who've read Tocqueville realize, and should hear a little bit of echo here, that Tocqueville argued that in America in the 1830s when he visited, America was characterized by two spirits. He said the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom. The spirit of freedom, he said, was energetic and, and, and kept pushing and pushing against boundaries. But because the spirit of religion, namely Christianity, so characterized the hearts and minds, the mores of Americans, it circumvented this spirit of religion. It kept it in check. Tocqueville says that in the, in the, in the realm of politics, that the spirit of of freedom kept pushing and going and innovating and it's great in economics it's great but then when it came up to the the limits imposed by the spirit of religion it came up short it said no more we're not going to go there it recognized boundaries it recognized limits imposed by religion and so for a time the vessel of religious belief was able to co uh, to contain the caustic acid of liberalism. And what you have, and Tocqueville recognized this, was a kind of wonderful um, uh, uh, equilibrium that allowed for freedom to flourish, but not to overstep its bounds and therefore not to destroy itself. Tocqueville's writing in the 1830s, though. What's happened since then? What we've seen is a decline in religious belief a decline in the, the strength and ability of the Christian faith to shape the political mores and the sensibilities of American citizens, which is to say the vessel, religious belief, that once contained and, and circumvented and, and, and limited freedom has been removed. 
eaten away or sacrificed. And here we find ourselves in a real problem. That wonderful equilibrium that was established by, at the times of the American founding, is no more difficult to imagine because the spirit of freedom has nothing to temper it. So for those who want to try to recover or speak in terms of this tempered liberalism, here's your challenge. Find a container that can contain liberalism. It's not an easy task. And it's, and it's not an easy task for two reasons. Just to find one that, that isn't implicated in liberalism, but also to find one that is resistant to the caustic working of liberalism. And typically what has had to happen, what had to happen in the early republic is a constant infusion of non-liberal aspects that establish a kind of foundation or limiting perspective on, on the spirit of freedom. Liberalism constantly eats its foundations and then becomes its opposite. How do you shore up the foundations? Clearly, a kind of resurgence and a recommitment to religious belief, to historic Christianity, that would be one option that would seem to uh, at least uh, plausibly restore this delicate balance between the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom, or, or circumvent or limit the spirit of religion, or spirit of freedom. Um, that is, uh, remains to be seen. There's a, another way of imagining this that I want to suggest and something I've been trying to work through myself as a fourth alternative that's not necessarily um, uh, completely uh, different than the third, although it's, I'm trying to speak in terms of liberty uh, from a perspective that's not rooted in liberalism. And, and it has two features, and one I call tradition-constituted liberty, and the other, humane localism. First of all, and I'm just going to do this quickly. My time is uh, nearly out, and so I'm just going to go over these two, uh, two views or suggestions quickly, and you can, um, we can talk about it during a Q&A if you want. Tradition-constituted liberty consists of three aspects. First, it respects individual liberty... Yes, but it can also accommodate the liberty of groups. It isn't beholden to or completely subsumed under the doctrinaire individualism that currently is dominant in our political and philosophical discourse. It can recognize the integrity of and the liberty of groups, not just individuals. We need to learn to speak beyond the kind of rampant individualism that we see in our age today. Second, this tradition constituted liberty acknowledges the role of limits. Limits imposed by tradition, by nature, and by God. And part of what's going to have to happen with this is we're going to need a reconstituted account of human nature that's rooted in some notion of teleology and some recovery of an ability to speak coherently and rationally in terms of a hierarchy of goods. We have to be able to recover that language of good that's not I feel statements, but we need to speak and to, to learn to speak in the language of moral realism. That moral truths are real facts, not simply impressions, intuitions, or uh, preferences like I prefer ice cream to jello. Third, this tradition-constituted liberty is characterized by a high appreciation of inheritance. We cannot, as Burke said, do justice to the future if we do not have a deep appreciation for the past. And those who want to speak of being on the right side of history have no concern with the past. They're only thinking in terms of the future. They all inhabit the disposition articulated by Henry Ford. History, he said, is bunk. Well, that is exactly the wrong way to think about it because history is what we have. History is the resource, it's the inheritance, and it carries along the institutions that we inhabit. It carries along with it the, the stories, the, the songs, the, the ways of expressing ourselves, the language that we speak 
itself is carried along in a kind of historical, as a kind of historical inheritance. We are then stewards. And this notion of stewardship is an essential aspect of what this tradition constituted account of liberty has to include. We have to see ourselves as inheritors who are obligated by virtue of that inheritance to tend well what we have inherited, to tend it well, to improve it where we can, and generously pass it on to the next generation in the hopes that they will do the same. That, I would submit to you, is how we must understand culture. Culture is not something we invent on the moment. It's a steady accretion of energetic and imaginative engagements with that which has been inherited. And if we want to be concerned about culture, we need to think about what we've inherited, and we need to think about it in terms of a gift that needs to be tended. For if we don't tend the gift, it will wither and die. Every culture is one generation away from extinction. You are the stewards of an inheritance. And if you take that seriously, you are doing what you ought. And if you neglect it, you are shirking a responsibility that you did not choose, but one that is yours nevertheless. Second, I think as an alternative to cosmopolitanism is what I want to call humane localism. Cosmopolitanism comes from the Greek word, citizen of the world, right? Citizen of everywhere, but not beholden to any place in particular. For the cosmopolitan, first loyalties are to the world at large. Cosmopolitans claim to love humanity, as Dostoevsky so clearly put it in the Brothers Karamazov, though it's easy to love humanity, it's really difficult to love particular human beings. They smell bad. They irritate you, all right? The bloodless love of humanity is easy and costs nothing, but it accomplishes nothing except giving you a warm sense of satisfaction at no price. For the cosmopolitan nations, regions, languages, traditions, religions don't matter. All are subsumed under the brotherhood of humanity. They all come secondary. And what I want to suggest to you is an alternative I call humane localism, and I'll just close with that. What I'm suggesting about humane localism represents something of a third way that avoids this liberal cosmopolitan temptation. Well, at the same time, it shuns any regressive tribal reaction. This third way between those two, humane localism, appreciates the variety and differences between cultures and the traditions born of those cultures and thus resists the homogenizing impulse that's so strong within modern liberal democracies. It recognizes that the language of global village represents an abstraction that will not satisfy human longings. Humane localism is characterized by a love for one's particular place, for one's particular traditions, and the people who inhabit them. Yet at the same time, humane localism is not animated by fear of the other, for by an act of imagination, it sees through the inevitable differences and recognizes the common humanity we all share. It recognizes that we are all living souls with needs and longings that bind us together, even as the particulars of our own places and traditions remind us of our distinctness. In short, humane localism is rooted in respect, not in homogeneity, in love for one's traditions, not hatred of other traditions, in a recognition that liberty is sustainable only within limits, and in the realization that human flourishing is best realized in the company of friends and neighbors sharing a common place in the world. Thank you for your attention. We have time for some questions now. I'll just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic. Well, 
Well, thanks for coming out tonight, Dr. Mitchell. I really enjoyed your talk. I have a question. You presented four roadmaps, essentially, where the Western world could go depending on what political systems and worldviews uh, the citizens of the West choose. I'm interested, you mentioned earlier how cosmopolitan liberalism controls liber uh, the entertainment industry and how crucial that is to um, shaping the imagination of the citizenry. If the second uh, hypothetical that you suggested, the one focusing on jingoism and the rise of nationalism takes place, what effect do you think that will have on the entertainment industry? Nothing well, nothing immediately, um, because there's still going to be a, a fight, and those who control um, uh, those outlets are going to be articulating a particular vision. Um, so uh, it, 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 nothing in the short term. Ideas and, uh, and these kinds of big ideas that I'm talking about um, require time um, to be fully realized. It's Nietzsche that said, ideas take time. Um, my time is not yet. He says, they, they won't understand me for 100 years. He's right. So these are, these are trends that can't simply be reversed quickly. And as long as, um, as, long as this liberal... Um, impulse, this liberal, liberal conception of the human person is in place. And I would say it's deeply embedded. There's, there's going to be um, various skirmishes and, and that aren't going to be easily uh, determined one way or the other. And probably what's more likely if, this, if uh, this kind of new tribalism emerges is that what will happen is um, there will be some parallel industries emerge. That is uh, another... Uh, uh, another um, set of individuals with capital will will start um, a, a kind of entertainment industry and so on that's going to run parallel with with what's already existing. There will be opportunities there for um, for uh, different expressions of the human person, the human good, which is is a good thing. Those kinds of expressions. It's, and here's something really important for you political types: the victory, the battle, or whatever you want to call it, is not going to be won at the ballot box. Even though you might be thinking, ah, oh, yeah, we got Trump, we got him. Or some of you might be saying, oh, no, Trump, they got him, um, if, you, if you're happy or not. But it's not at the ballot box, it's at the imagination. Napoleon himself said that imagination makes the world go around. You've got to capture the minds, the, that is the imagination of, of, a, of a generation. And the imagination is captured by articulating in compelling and clear ways a contrary vision of the good life. And so there are institutional things that can be done, but, but there are also very personal things that can be done. How are you living in such a way that your life, the choices you make, the, the books you read, the, the kinds of way you spend your free time, how are you living in such a way that you are modeling a conception of the good life that runs counter to the, the, um, the orthodoxy of autonomy? That's something that all of us can give some serious thought to. Um, I just want to thank you for your talk. Um, my question is if if freedom at a basic level is a lack of restraint from something to do something else, can it really ever be uh, an, an end or a focus in society if there's not a higher end to direct <clears throat> it towards? Yeah. Well, your question is a good one, and, and much turns on what we mean by freedom, but a short answer, if we conceive of freedom in that way, it's not a very adequate end, right? Which is why equality wins in terms of an end. It's one that we can conceive of in more concrete terms as, as, a, as a viable alternative. And so when those two clash in terms of the ideals expressed by uh, the social contract tradition, uh, equality comes out on top. And probably the way that you've expressed it uh, is, is one of the reasons why. That, I don't think, is the only way to conceive of freedom. Um, you certainly think of someone like Aristotle would think of freedom is doing what is proper according to one's nature. 
That is, it's, it's acting according to nature. But as soon as we say according to, we're talking about a kind of direction a toward a, a certain to ends that are proper to what we are as human beings. And so that's a, a different conception of freedom and one I think that we need to, um, to reconsider. I had a question about, you mentioned it, I believe, in the fourth uh, direction that we could go about humane localism, about the difference between the rights of groups as opposed to the yeah. rights of the radical yeah. individual. I was wondering, how does that relate to identity politics and the yeah. idea yeah, that yeah. we divide society by, by race, by yeah. sexual orientation, yeah. by gender, yeah. and um, what are the differences and similarities, I yeah. guess, between what you would envision? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. Uh, I didn't say... Um, the rights of groups. I said the liberty of groups. And there is a difference there. Because what I'm trying to do is, is back off the language of rights. It's, uh, uh, I think it's, it's so pervasive that, that I, I, I think it's, it's, we've come to a point where the language of rights is so unmoored that they do at least as much harm as good. Because rights have to be tied to a particular conception of the human person uh, that, that's, that's, that's conceived as, as a, uh, uh, an individual who has, is, is, is uh, oriented to certain, certain ends. And, um, and these, these notions of rights grow historically out of, of a natural law tradition so that it implies a whole lot of duties and so on. So the language of rights is something I'm, I want to back off from. Um, but the idea of freedom of groups, what, I'm, what I mean by this is that, is this. Um, we have come to, our, our, we've come through an imaginative process to conclude or act or speak as if the only thing that matters is individuals, and we think as the of the autonomous individual as the the locus of all our understanding. I want to suggest that, and you're right to say, well, there's a danger here in terms of uh, identity politics, sure, um, but to say. Um, does a church have a liberty to behave in a certain way, to act, to, to set up its own institutions and, and provisions? Does, does, a, uh, uh, does a state, does a county, does a city, that, that is to think of these as, as, as corporate bodies, but not in a kind of organic sense, but one that really does matter. We can think of the, the, uh, the, the will of this group as having something, is consisting of something more than simply the, uh, the aggregation of independent, individual wills. It's, 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 not a, it's not a huge thing, but I do think it's, it's something we need to um, open up our, our uh, minds to thinking in terms beyond the autonomous individual. That's really what I'm trying to push on. How do we... Um, how do we resist that? Because I think at the heart of, is, is, is what we have is individualism, um, and that is a, is, a, is a real problem. We need to really uh, rethink our use of the word individual. It's, it's, uh, there's this better word. It's person. Right? That person implies personality, and it has a history that is metaphysically much richer in terms of what does it mean to be Well, God, is God an individual or is God a person? God in three individuals, oh, that's not the hymn, is it? God in three persons, blessed trinity, right? And, uh, and this idea of person has theolo theological resonance and philosophical resonance, and I think we need to, this is, that's, that's the, my point, we need to push on that and try to, to uh, resist the language of autonomy or the autonomous individual at the expense of alternatives. Hello, Dr. Mitchell. Justin. Thank you. Missed you in class this morning. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> told Daniel you were going to say that. Um, at the beginning, you talked about um, how there's a repaganization of society, um, and it's kind of looking like um, politics is becoming ultimate yeah. and extreme. Um, but then later on, when you're talking about the cosmopolitans, uh, you mentioned how their end goal seems to be a post-political yeah. society. Um, and so it seems like those two things yeah. are contradictory. I don't think that they actually are, but maybe you could talk yeah, a little sure. bit. Um, the, the logic would be that this, I think, that we're going to have, have to have a period of heightened 
um, uh, political engagement and political passion in order to overcome politics. It's the same sense, the same kind of trajectory you see in Marx, right? What we're going to have is this, is this political revolution uh, that will usher in the withering of the state, right? We're, we're going to have this, this heightened event or moment or time that will usher in something almost its opposite later on. I think the same kind of impulse is present here. Both are utopian. Both um, are, are not in keeping with, with a proper understanding of what, uh, what human society is or what the human person is. But that's not the important thing. What is important is the aspiration rooted in a kind of imaginative conception of the future. My question is a little bit more open-ended. In regards to the four paths that you laid out for the West, I think uh, most people would agree that any of those four paths could be taken by anyone within that context. But for the American Christian, would you say that there are only those four paths? Are there other paths that could be yeah. taken? How does the distinction of Christian and within our understanding of worldview, how does that change yeah. the paths that maybe are available? Are there are some closed off and more and really, are there other paths that maybe the Christian should consider yeah. taking that someone who's not a Christian would not necessarily consider? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it really depends on a couple things. One, as I suggested, most Americans are liberals, and I would suggest that most Christians are, uh, have, have, have sipped um, rather carelessly from that cup, which then uh, paves the way for um, political alternatives that ought not to be taken by Christians, but very well may be taken by Christians. So that's something we at least have to keep in mind. That there is a, uh, uh, but but yeah, I would say uh, uh, kind of tribalism that is, is something Christians ought to resist, right? And there is a sense in which Christians and, and uh, Christianity is a kind of cosmopolitanism. And this is where we have to be really careful in our in our, in our definitions, because Christ comes to set up a what? A universal church. All right? The church universal is something that, that is for all people. Now, that, that would seem to be cosmopolitan, but what we have is instantiations at, at the local level of local congregations, but we also have, um, you can think of um, a kind of a moral context. To whom do we owe duties? To whom do we owe moral duties? Right now, I'm almost certain of it, that a child is drowning somewhere in India, probably in the Ganges River. Are, do you have a moral duty to see that that stops? See, if we, if we extended our, in a sort of reckless way, extended our sense of moral duties, it would leave us paralyzed by a sense of, 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 of impotence, right? Think of Christ's parable of the Good Samaritan. To whom do we owe duties? Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, and someone said, well, who's my neighbor? And think of the way Jesus responds. Well, there's a man who traveled down to Jericho for a very particular place. And there was a teacher of the law. There was a priest who ignored him. And a Samaritan came along and helped him. Who did he help? He helped the person in his proximity. He helped the person that he could help. Right? There's a kind of limit to our loves, a limit to our concern, a limit to our moral duties simply by virtue of the fact that we are spatial and temporal creatures. You inhabit a particular space and time. And you can't get out of it. Which means there are particular duties rooted in proximity that are proper to us. So we can say, in a way, Christianity opens the door to a kind of more expansive, certainly beyond tribalism. Because what does the Good Samaritan teach us? It's not just, you don't just care for the Jews. You just don't care for people of your tribe. You care for human beings who are in need, who come within your sphere of influence. Right? So that, in a way, defeats this kind of violent tribalism that certainly could emerge. And I think we're going to see it increasingly 
um, in, in just keep an eye on Western Europe. All right, there's, there's, this is going to happen. It's going to be a backlash against uh, immigration, and it's going it, to. There's potential for it to be ugly. Um, but Christianity teaches us that's not legitimate. Our neighbor is not limited to fellow tribesmen. It is human beings for whom Christ died. So that kind, that, that it would seem to me that option is really off the table for Christians. That doesn't necessarily mean that a kind of of uh, um, of populism and patriotism of a healthy sort isn't proper. All right? those, those are compatible uh, with Christianity to an extent, as long as the patriotism is always with an asterisk that I am a citizen first and foremost of the city of God, and my loyalties to any political entity are always subordinate to a higher and more permanent and more fundamental loyalty. But we could work a kind of, a kind of loyalty to a particular place there. Um, I think cosmopolitanism of the most, of the strongest sense is not in keeping with the ethics of Christianity rooted in the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. That is, you can't love the world. Christ can love the world because he's God. He has a kind of infinite capacity for love because he is an infinite member of the eternal Godhead. You and I, we are finite, contingent, spatially and temporally located. And therefore, our, the, the extent of our loves is far more modest. But that is an excuse not to love. It's to recognize uh, that, that there are limits even to that. So there's a kind of cosmopolitanism that I think Christians need to resist. Um, there are other um, versions or, or alternatives I would su uh, suspect that Christians could take. Um, one that's, that's not, I think, uh, incompatible with my fourth alternative, the, the tradition constituted liberty and humane localism, is what uh, Rod Dreher has been talking about in the last year or so, the Benedict Option. Is some of you familiar with? You all follow that? Um, just Google Rod Dreher. He's got a book coming out in April on this. And, and he's saying that in a post-Christian society, Christians are going to have to rethink what it means to be faithful Christians, that the, that the culture war has been lost, the tide is moving very strongly in one direction, and we're no longer going to simply be able to make peace with institutions. We're going to have to set up competing and, and parallel institutions in order to preserve the practice of faithful Christianity. At the end of the day, it's the question of how are we going to make disciples? And a steady stream of Hollywood and television and YouTube and whatever it is that we uh, parks and rec, or as you people watch, is not conducive to the cultivation of faithful disciples. What do you love? This really, it, everything comes down to that. What is it that you love? And what's the object of your love? And what are the orders of your loves? And what I'm suggesting with humane localism is our loves start with the particular and move out from the particular. They don't start from the universal and trickle down. With uh, tradition constituted liberty, I'm saying we love in the particular, not in the abstract. That's the difference. Dr. Mitchell, it's good to hear you. Lance. Hello, sir. How are you? It's good I'm to see good. you. Good, good. Um, your notion of tradition constituted liberty seems to uh, turn in part, at least, on a notion of value-laden language, uh, morality-laden language. Yeah. But as you mentioned earlier in your speech, this, this value-laden language has been subverted by McIntyre's emotivism yeah. um, and the, the language of I feel like and, yeah. and I, 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 this is my desire, my emotion, my feeling. Yeah. Um, and tradition, constant liberty, seems like a good reaction against cosmopolitanism and the language that it implies. However, we at Patrick Henry College are not trained to react against only, but also to reclaim. Yeah. So how do we reclaim this moral-laden language, this, this mor moray-laden yeah. language, especially in a culture of emotivism that is so dangerous because, precisely because, it can take all that moral language and reduce it to the I feel yeah. statement? It's a great question. It's not an, it's not an easy project uh, to undertake. Um, as I suggested a little earlier, um, I think at, 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 very re at the very least we can start with 
um, resisting that kind of language ourselves, which is say, I hear every day in the classroom students not intending to, but framing their arguments in terms of they're congenial to this emotivist, uh, purely preferential kind of thinking. Um, it's not natural for most students to speak in terms, for instance, of moral facts. We think facts? Facts are what scientists get when they, when they pour some stuff into a beaker and heat it up to a certain temperature. Ah, that's a fact. And poetry, that's, well, that's subjective feelings and stuff. Or philosophy, that's just what you think, that's just your opinion. All right, and, 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 and heaven forbid that we should refer to theology as a science, all right? That, those, that we have this fact-value division that runs so very deeply in not just our practice, but, the, but our habits of mind. And we need to, in a way, reintegrate the world. Or to think of in these, words, in these terms, with a fact-value distinction, what we've got is a dead world of facts, a dead world of materiality, and a live world of imagination, but it's only, um, it's, it's per purely subjective. What we need is, is a reinvigoration and a re-enchantment of the world, a recognition that this creation that we inhabit is deeply meaningful, that it is infused with God's grandeur. And, and in it, we can see the fingerprint of God that we don't see the natural world as a dead substance that, that, we, that we manipulate, but something that is a gift and one through which we can better understand ourselves and our God. That is a re-enchantment of the natural world may be a good place to start because what that does is promises the, the possibility of bridging this gap that's been in place for the last 300 years and recovering the language of value rooted in the natural world and the language and capacity to speak in terms of human nature itself as a normative reality. There's a lot there to unpack, but I'd say at least that's a place to start. Let's give Dr. Mitchell another hand. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. <laughs>